Welcome. <laughs> it's so phony to everyone in, in class here because we've all been chattering and visiting and talking and then I act like we're just starting. This is like filming in front of a, a live studio audience, but we have a laugh track later. I superimpose over some of my jokes when nobody laughs. I, I put a laugh track on it if you haven't been watching the the videos. I'll, I'll have to show you. I'm, I'm, record, I'm recording and I'm in a weird spot, so I, it's a little bit hard, harder to make. Don, you're hiding behind the light here, so. All uh, right. So it, it's a little bit, the way the class begins, I'll show you uh, on, on another, in another class, I'll show you a little clip of the way I'm doing the beginning of the video now, but it's pretty neat. Um, all right. So, the end of class last time, this fascinating episode with Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. And there are a lot of great things to learn, and obviously the Holy Spirit had Luke tell us quite a bit about him and his exchange with, with Peter, remember, and the rebuke that Peter gave him. And, and just at the very end of class, we were hurriedly talking about how Peter says he's in, the, he's in the gall of bitterness, he's in the bond of iniquity. See, here are some great principles here that tell us not just about Simon, but, but what sin does to us, right? That when we, when we allow these passions, these desires to rule us, we're in a kind of bondage to our sin, and Scripture will talk about that kind of thing over and over. So I think I will preach. I've never given a sermon on Simon in this whole episode that I can remember in 30 years of preaching, so it seemed like it would be something good for us to address from the pulpit. But now, now, we're getting to a great and familiar and maybe one of the more beloved stories in all the book of Acts, maybe in the Bible, but we're, we're also shifting now to a new epic in church history that God is going to bring about. God is going to bring about this momentous movement in the spread of the gospel through one man going out on a desert road and talking to, think about this, and talking to another man on his journey. And it's, I, I just find it profound what God is doing through Philip here. So I've chosen to call this, uh, the gospel goes to Africa. Because in Philip's encounter with the, the eunuch, he's going to Ethiopian, which is, a term used in scripture for essentially, this might be a bit simplistic, but in the Bible, Ethiopia refers to all of Africa or Africa south of Egypt, that, that whole region. And Luke's going to focus on Paul's missionary journeys and the spread of the gospel in the Mediterranean world, but it's fascinating to think of how it's going out what about what the other apostles were doing and the places they were going and the gospel moving to other continents and other parts of the world? So, and also, also, we think of the first time the gospel goes to a, an uncircumcised Gentile. Who's that? Where do we see where the door of the church is open to the Gentiles? Cornelius, Cornelius right? Cornelius, the, the military the Roman soldier, the Roman officer, when Peter goes there, and that, Luke's going to focus on that, two chapters, Acts 10 and 11, or two, uh, a chapter and a half uh, that from Acts 10 through the first part of Acts 11. So that, that's, that is momentous as well, but here's a precursor to that, because here is a God-fearing man who believes in the God of Israel and who worships the God of Israel, but uh, is not a proselyte, is not a Jew, and he is going to be taught the gospel and baptized into Christ and become a Christian. So, also, it's, this, is, this is very interesting to me, too. There, there's my term, right? I should just get a shirt to wear a t-shirt in class that just says, this is very interesting. That way, I don't have to keep saying it or just to further gaslight you, but so far we're, we've seen the gospel preached in 
in public ways to whole groups of people, like in Acts 2, right, on the day of Pentecost. And then Philip goes to Samaria, and we're told that they gave heed to the things that he taught. And he does mention this individual, Simon, where you get into some uh, uh, specifics about one particular person. But while we have these moments and acts of public speeches and public pro proclamation, this is one of those personal, this is one of those personal encounters, a one-on-one, -on -one where, where Luke takes a, a, a lot of space. Think of all the individuals being converted. Think of all the Bible studies going on. Think of all the teaching that's taking place. And Luke selects specific instances and says, now here's one, like Paul talking to the jailer, right? Paul going to Lydia's house and teaching her and her household. And Cornelius is one of those, and it's the first one we get to in the book of Acts. So this is huge. This is huge. All right, let's, you know, I spend so, so much time telling you what we're going to study that we never actually study it. So uh, let, let's, let's look at it. So now, and that, that kind of gives us a, a, a shift here uh, to, to say, okay, now this was what all this led to here, kind of a transitional statement. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip. So we see an angel is being utilized here, right? And then the spirit is going to communicate directly with Philip. And what have I been saying over and over so much taking place in Acts is not normative. It's not, I, I don't think you can read this and say, well, God sent, God is going to send an angel to me to tell me to go teach the gospel to somebody. I, people make those claims. Or the Holy Spirit told me to come and teach you this verse. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Many, Many times. <laughs> Many times, John said. Based on the Facebook all the time in my right, okay, in, in his uh, Facebook, in his web page, in his teaching ministry that John has online, he gets a lot of that, right? And I've, I've had people say it to me, that the Spirit laid this on their heart, or the Spirit told them to say this. And, and when, you, when you are incredulous, when you're skeptical of that, they think, well, it's right there in the Bible. Again, so much taking place here that is not normative, but God's stepping into history. This is a specific time. God's acting in a specific way in a transitionary period. And so it's a, it's, it's a unique period in a lot of ways. We need to keep that in mind. We're going we're gonna to start expecting God to be doing things and, and misinterpreting events in our lives as, as thinking God is doing this or doing that because we're reading about it in the book of Acts. And yet, we want to discern and pull the principles out here that do very much apply to how God wants me to teach other people the gospel, right? So we're trying to be discerning. The angel, we're told, is the angel of the Lord, right? Where do you hear that language? The angel of the Lord. We saw that, right, over and over in Genesis, in the... In the in the Pentateuch, and you see it in Judges, for example, and I've given a couple of passages there where usually those are theophanies, or they can be referring to the appearance of God in some human form described uh, as an angel. And so it a, it's a, can be a divine presence in some way, not necessarily saying that's, I know that's the case here, but remember we said, and, and I said this in my introduction to the Gospels class about Luke's Gospel and some of the unique things about Luke, because this is, for the thousandth time, I know I've said it, this is Luke part two. Luke is the Gospel that has the most references to angels, that talks the most about angels. And here I've listed some of the passages in Acts where we're going to see angels involved. Angels letting the apostles out of prison, right? Angels letting Peter out of prison. An angel striking Herod dead. An angel speaks to Paul on the ship. An angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve uh, spoke to me this night, he says. So you see how, isn't it interesting, Luke likes to tell us when God was stepping stepping in to people's lives and utilizing angels. And there's a lot of uh, superstitious, I think, belief about angels in our culture today. Let me ask you, think about why people have such a fascination with angels while I ask uh, Anna what... Uh, the angel of the Lord 
Yes. Me, I don't have a verse to quote with it. Okay. It means Jesus Christ in, in every situation is what I have found through the, through the years. I think it does in several places. I'm not saying it does. I'm saying in the Hebrew it Bible. Seems to me that right. Jesus Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think it's significant that he doesn't just say an angel from God came or an angel spoke. This is that terminology, echoes of the Hebrew Bible, of terminology, of concepts familiar, especially in the, in the Jewish context, right? This is the angel of the Lord. And what's that supposed to trigger in your mind like it did in yours, see? So I like that, yeah. Why do you think people have such a fascination with angels, uh, I didn't plan to get into this, so I'll just, we'll just briefly address it, but I, I find it interesting, like everything else I, I'm telling you, I'm saying is interesting, right? Heather, Heather, what's, what's the deal with angels? I know, I scared you, I startled you. <laughs> but, uh, no, why, why do you think people like to believe that God, that there are angels watching over them, and that there are angels that up here and that angels do this and angels do that I, I've got a I've got a theory that it's very comforting you know I think the big deal with angels is you can believe in angels but you don't have to believe in the God of Scripture you don't have to believe in all the commandments and the law of God and all the obligation it's just the uh, angels watch over us angels minister to us angels speak to us angels are all, all around us and ministering to us. And, and that's the kind of religion a lot of people want, is supernatural intervention in their life, but not this God who commands me and obligates me and not all these uh, uh, restrictions of a, of a particular religious order, but just, just vague... Variant of angels. Vague... Variant of angels. Yeah, well, and you, you think of how many times... God is called the uh, Lord of hosts, and a lot of times that refers to heavenly hosts, the angels, and the myriads of angels. Jesus spoke uh, of, of that. We find that in Scripture. Kind of like a bunch of little radar O'Reilly's running around all the time. Radar? Radar O'Reilly's. Yeah. Smash. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I again, <laughs> that's a fun way to think of it. I, I think people want the comfort of supernatural intervention in their lives without the imposition of any kind of structured religion. Does that, do you not see that in our culture? Well, Mike? God created them for some reason, he or would. he wouldn't have created them, since they are created individuals, and we tend to think that that's what we become when we die. Yeah. God did indeed create them. Oh, right, right. Yeah, and Hebrews, Hebrews 1.14 says one of their functions is to minister to God's people. So, but but pe people want that, but not the God behind the, the ministering who speaks by his law and commands us to. So you can find people who aren't very religious and don't attend church and don't worship God or anything, but, oh, they, they think angels are watching over them. So, because of movies and films. Yeah, and that's, that's popularized in film. Yeah, Clarence. yeah. I know Clarence and It's a don't diss my favorite movie of all time. It's a Wonderful Life, but yep. it does bother me the way Clarence is portrayed as having to earn his wings and trying not to take a drink of alcohol because he used to love to drink, you know, before and he's trying yeah. to now he's an angel. So and the idea that when you die you become an angel. That's w what Anna just said. And that's not what Scripture teaches. All right, I said way too much about angels. So, all right, so rise and go toward the south. The expression, he tells him now, he's, he's having a fruitful ministry here. He's teaching in Samaria. Many of the Samaritans believed. So there's a lot of people there. They, they gave heed to the things he taught. They were baptized. There are Christians there. There's a new community of believers. Why pull Philip away and send him way out into this, on this trip? You know, that, that Ethiopian nobleman, that officer of the court of the queen, his soul is just as important as everybody else's. And there might be a time God pulls you away because there's somebody, again, now I'm speaking providentially and I'm not claiming we can identify with certainty God's providence in our lives. But sometimes it may not make sense. This is what I wanted to say. Sometimes... What's happening in our lives might not make sense to us, 
that it may even be taking us away from a place where it might seem to us makes the most sense, where we can do the most good. But it could be God needs you to go down to Gaza and is working things in your life to get you in, to encounter someone else that needs to hear the gospel, right? To me, that's very... Uh, uh, thrilling thought. He tells them to go toward the south and actually uh, that can be toward the south can say uh, at midday. The Greek t expression can also mean at midday, which if that were true, it would be unusual. It would make this all the more extraordinary because in the heat of midday, people generally didn't travel. So uh, it, it could mean that, but it also can mean toward the south, and that is the way to go. There are two ways to go from Jerusalem down through um, southern, southwestern Palestine into Africa, and uh, this path would go pr likely the one from Hebron and then over to the coast down through Gaza. I'm going to show that in a minute. So, so think of how the, the angel and the spirit are, are at work here by the hand of God and uh, think of how the providence of God, I wanted to say, might, might work in our lives to move us into a place where he needs us to reach somebody with the gospel. Hey, Tyler, I just love the little phrase that Luke inserts there. And mine is just three words. It says, this is desert. That's yeah. The quote, this is desert, you know. Yeah, now, I, I, have, a, I have a note in my Bible to, to call attention to that, right. Why, why do you think he's saying that? Why do you think he's saying that? This was an unusual thing to tell Philip to do. Go down through this area, not a populated area, not an inhabited area. Why? And he doesn't even say, because there's a man there I want you to go talk to. He just says, go. Right? And it's, not, it's after he does what God says to do without an explanation, but trusting God and, and doing what God said. Then he sees the eunuch, and then the spirit says, go talk to him. So, uh, but what I, what's interesting to me is this, keep this in mind too, and I bring this up over and over when I preach, especially when I look at these episodes in the book of Acts, is even though the Lord is involved in a supernatural way, we have angels speaking in the Holy Spirit, God did not send an angel directly to the eunuch. Why? He could have done that, right? The Holy Spirit could have, instead of talking to Philip, he could have talked directly to the eunuch. The angel could have just gone directly. Why bother Philip to have to go to all that trouble? But the point is, you see it over and over throughout the book of Acts. Even when God's hand is involved in a supernatural way and he's orchestrating events, when it comes to learning what to do to be saved, he never speaks to Even when Jesus appears to Saul, right? Does Jesus tell Saul how to be saved? He sends a man with him, uh, to him, with the message. So it's always, this is God's way for people to be saved. He could directly communicate to every person on the face of the earth and tell everyone tonight what he expects them to do in order to be saved. That's not, that's not how God has chosen to operate, is it? And so even here in all of this activity, it's sending a man uh, with a message. So, uh, yeah, and the way is desert. So that tells you a little something, Luke inserting that. And you, you, you learn something here about, or it's also interesting when you think of echoes of, of the Hebrew Bible and, and Israel's history. I want you to think of these similarities between Philip and Elijah. Both involve an angel of the Lord communicating to them, connecting with them. Both involve, move, uh, they move from one place to another by means of the Spirit. We're told at the end of this account, the Spirit caught Philip away, and that happens to Elijah. And it's also interesting that you have in 1 Kings 18 with Ahab, you have Elijah also running down the road where the, with a chariot, where there's a chariot with an important person in it. And, and so it, it could be intentionally set up by God to show us God's using Philip as a prophet, just like Elijah. He's a, he's a true, legitimate prophet of God. So what is he telling him to do? So he, 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 he sends him to Gaza. And as we pointed out a moment ago, this way is desert. So he, Luke wants the reader to know this is an out of the way thing going on here. And he arose and went. 
and there, th this Gaza area, I'm going to show you this in a minute, and that it says he, there was this Ethiopian, we'll talk about that, and he mentions he was a, several things, he is a eunuch, a court official, here it says of Candace, uh, and it's actually from the Kandake, the term for the dynasty of queens in Ethiopia, but it was mistaken at some point in history as a name, and so then it was used here. And so anyone named Candace, though, that's where that name comes from, from the Nubian queens uh, who were called Kandake, and then in scripture it ended up being as though it were a name of one particular queen of uh, uh, named Candace. But she, he was in the service of this queen who was queen of all the Ethiopians. Well, again, we said the term is used in a very general way in scripture, Ethiopia, of, of the region of Africa once you get past Egypt. And they were known for very dark skin because when you move into Egypt, the, the skin, uh, the, the general skin tone of the ethnic groups that make up the Egyptian people is darker than Israelites and then further south the skin tone is uh, even darker so that was one way these the people from that region were distinguished from from the people of Egypt so this is in all likelihood this is a reference to what, what the the Kushite queen the kingdom of Kush in the region known as Nubia. I'm going to show you this here. and This works. It'll be awesome if I can get this to work. So let's all pause and say a prayer for the technology here. I want to show this to you, this video. Well, it might not, but if I, I can still write on this here. It's this region here. So here you see, I guess I can, I can blow this up, though, right? Yeah. All right, so this is the region. This is where he's going to be going from, here. And he's going to move along this way, and he's going to be traveling the Ethiopian down into this region, which is Nubia, where the Kushite kings were. Kush, C-U-S-H, is what is the term you find in Scripture in the prophets in the Old Testament for this region. And so that is his path home there and where he's going and this region you see the Nile there in Egypt you, along the Nile it's this region here which today is Sudan not actually Ethiopia which is more in this area down here so uh, not sure why why my video didn't show them. let me try this here hold on oh because it's here all right ready let's try this this is really neat I want to show where this is in relationship to where you are right now. Oh, good. This is a screen capture. So here, here we are. And then I typed in, OK, wave, wave, Rose. Wave out the window there. Well, go to the window and wave. It's Google Earth. It's a live feed. No. All right, so pull back on the Earth. And let's go to the other side of the planet. Isn't that cool? I mean, you could spend hours and hours on Google Earth. I, I'm on it like almost every day looking for places. John, as soon as you told me where you were from, I wanted to pull it up on Google Earth and see okay. in South okay, Africa. South. Right, oh, you're way down on the, I know. It's interesting that the Kushites are the descendants of Ham, son of Noah. <laughs> okay, right. You know, I hadn't thought to make that connection. All right. So here I'm trying to show that region more specifically here, the Nubian Desert, this region. And uh, here, uh, the reason I'm pulling back here is I just wanted to show you where it is in relationship to, I was trying to show it in relationship to where he's starting from up there. All right, and then I got one more. One more. How far that was? In miles? Or I tried to find, I looked this up. I know it's hundreds of miles, but. I was told it's 500 miles. OK. So imagine traveling by chariot uh, on, on difficult roadways, 500 miles to go worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the journey? I mean, and I don't think even at, at that time there were any buckies yet uh, along the way, uh, as far as I know. Somebody check that and see. All right, now here I wanted to show you Gaza. 
he's told to go down through Gaza. So look, the Gaza Strip, which Israel recently relinquished and turned over to the Palestinians, and it's ruled by Hamas, one of the most wretched places on earth to, to, to be cursed to have to live right now. It's uh, terrible there. And by the way, in Ethiopia right now is a horrible civil war. In Ethiopia, we, don't, we, we hear a lot about Ukraine. We don't hear as much about, if anything, about the civil war in Ethiopia over, not, listen, half a million have died. Uh, and there's been horrific violations of human rights, uh, ethnocide, there's genocide going on there, uh, pe people being burned alive, being slaughtered in, in thousands. It's a brutal, brutal civil war. But these queens in this region were once very, very powerful. For, so here again is the, uh, just for your reference, is what, Philip's was in Samaria. And then see, if he goes down to Jerusalem, this would be the route he would take into Gaza down, down in that area. And then later he'll come back along the coastline and end up in Caesarea where he'll stay then. So God's going to bring him uh, back into that, that area. But um, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the queen here in just a moment. But he's a eunuch. Now as a eunuch, someone who's been, a, a, it can just mean an important official who serves in the court of royalty without necessarily meaning someone who's been castrated or emasculated, but it seems from the way Luke describes him, he was actually a, a eunuch. And according to the law of Moses, eunuchs were not, so even if he became a proselyte to Judaism, to the religion of the Israelites, he would not be allowed in the inner court of the temple. The law of Moses forbade anyone with this kind of mutilation from entering in beyond the outer courts. Uh, he, he wouldn't be allowed beyond the outer courts. But there's a beautiful prophecy here. Wasn't it for several generations even? Um, after, uh, after there was a... The, one, the, the prohibition for several generations, I think, was the Moabite. There was a specific, after an incident with the Moabites, then no Moabite could for, for several generations. But you can check that Deuteronomy text, that, see if that... All right, well, who did he go to worship? Right. He, so he went all that way to Jerusalem to worship God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the temple. When he's on his way back, he's reading from the, the scriptures of the Jewish people, of the Hebrews. He's reading from a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So he believes in the one true God, but he doesn't know who this Messiah is. He doesn't know who the servant of the Lord is that he's reading about. And here's what's beautiful about this when you put it in the context of all of Scripture, what's happening here. Isaiah, he's reading from Isaiah. And this may have been a special of interest to him because Isaiah, the prophet, spoke of an era coming, a day coming, when eunuchs would be once more welcome in God's presence. So Isaiah 56, notice, let not the foreigner who's enjoyed himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people, these people outside of Israel. No, no, no. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. Like, see, I would never qualify to be a part of Israel's God uh, his people, the, the people of Israel's God. L let him not say that, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, right? Who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall never be cut off. So there's this wonderful promise, this comforting hope that one day even people like me could be accepted all the way into the presence of God, not just be restricted to the outer courts. That's the prophet he's reading from. So what about this, I mentioned already, the Kandake uh, and it, how it's rendered Candace here. But I want you to just know a little bit about this and then we'll actually go through the text. Um, but th that's a, a Nubian, that's a, a s statue of a Nubian from this region, just to get an idea of what... Uh, perhaps uh, the, the people looked like in this region where, where this eunuch is from. But these were powerful queens who ruled in that era. 
in that part of the world. And so I was able to find some really good artwork depicting that. And the, the queens there were often depicted as, as fat. And that was a sign of prosperity. People wanted to be fat. People envied, envied you if you were fat. Uh, I know today we look at that as a negative. But see, she's, she's portrayed these queens as, as powerful and conquering and very uh, healthy. Let's say it that way, OK? So you have these depictions. See, we know from, from steles, from, from archaeological finds, we have evidence of how they were you know, how they may have looked, how they were portrayed. And in this particular one, notice the one eye. What this, there was a famous queen from this era during this time, was known as the, the queen, the one-eyed queen, because she had a one eye that was bad. But Rome, during this time, one, one queen in particular, Amanoranus, was famous because she went up into Egypt. There was a lot of uh, commerce with Egypt and sometimes conflict and she went up into Egypt during the era when the Romans the Roman Empire ruled the Mediterranean world and actually knocked over a statue uh, a bust or a statue of one of the Roman emperors uh, to defy Rome is that you, you don't rule in this part of the world and so Rome sent uh, so there was tension there because Rome received a lot of goods from this part of Africa and so there was tension there, and Augustus came and tried to go through Egypt and go and conquer the people there, and, and the queen was able to hold them off, and it sort of ended in a stalemate, and an agreement then was made as a result of that. And so in history, again, there was this standoff between Rome and the Nubian rulers, or this queen, the Kushite queen. And so to think of, uh, you know, it's a proud heritage, it's a proud history to think of what took place in this part of the world. Well, this is where this eunuch is from. He's a nobleman in the court of a very powerful uh, queen in a very powerful empire in this part of the world. Well, God wants the gospel to go to this part of the world, and he wants this man to, to hear the truth. And so sometimes you'll see African queens depicted in this way, I think, because of the history of these uh, particular Queens. It's very now. By the way, Christianity. What quote? Christianity. What's generally characterized as Christianity, eventually came to thrive in Ethiopia and in this region for centuries, for many centuries. Forms of Christianity were thriving there until what happened? What changed all that? The Muhammad. And the Arabs, the Islamification, the Islamization of this region ended up uh, making the area, uh, though there's still a presence, there are still churches there. Um, it, it ended up, you know, the monasteries and other things turned into mosques. And, and so after centuries of a st very strong, dominant presence of Christianity in the culture there, uh, it's now predominantly Islamic. So to think of the changes that have happened. How commonplace was it that he was reading from Isaiah? All right, well, well yeah, let's, let's get to that. Yeah, he's got a copy of Scripture. Barry, is very, 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 very politely moves me along, you know. It's like, <laughs> so about this next part in the text, Tyler, what about that? Okay, so, yeah, so he arose and he went, and so there was this Ethiopian. Uh, now, by the way, he was in charge of all of her treasure and s s being a powerful, wealthy empire. So this makes him secretary of the state. This makes him a very powerful person. So here's the first time we're reading as someone of, of this status, of this stature, uh, being converted to Christ. So he had come to Jerusalem to worship, right? We addressed that and Rose asked about that. So he'd gone all this way. Here's a man deeply devoted who wanted to be in the presence of the God of Israel and who knew that he was the true God and wanted to be there to worship him. So he'd gone all that way just to be at the temple. Uh, and so he was returning. He was seated in his chariot. Only wealthy people had chariots. And, you know, you imagine this is sort of like the SUV of the time. But just to be able to travel by a horse-drawn chariot like that was an incredible luxury. But can you imagine how painful and difficult it would be to go hundreds of miles in a a chariot from that day. And, and so Barry's question was, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip apparently hears him reading. He hears the part of scripture that he's reading. So a couple things. 
people generally read out loud in the ancient world. Reading silently to yourself was not a, not a common practice. It really wasn't something developed at that time. So if you were reading something, you generally read it out loud. Do you ever read scripture out loud just in your own devotions? I do that occasionally, especially in the Psalms, and I've done it with like the prologue of John. I like to read the Greek and just hear the sound of, of the text sometimes, but uh, do that sometime. And if you're reading through a psalm, read it out loud. But he was reading out loud from the prophet Isaiah. So he has a scroll. He has a copy of the prophet Isaiah. This is a luxury. This, again, this is something that not very few people, they didn't have their own Bibles, right? You went to the synagogue and you hoped your community had a scroll of the Torah with the law and maybe some of the prophets, but it was a, a, a rare blessing to have access to your own scriptures, to think that we neglect the word of God. What a privilege it is to be able to hold in your own hand, your own copy of the Word of God is a pro, in your own language, is a, uh, a blessing that is, that many people have not known and could not even imagine in the ancient world, to have your own, to have access to it, the ease of access to it like we do today. So he has his own Bible. Likely, this is a Greek translation of Isaiah, so he may have gotten it in Jerusalem, he, more likely in Alexandria, Egypt, which is a very important city. That's where the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible was made, in Alexandria, Egypt. So very, it's very likely he would have had a copy from, from that region. So the, now the Spirit steps in and says, go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him. So we like that too, right? He has four virgin daughters, we learn later. And since people generally, girls generally married young then, if he has four virgin daughters, daughters that are still fairly young, he's probably a fairly young man. So he's able to run alongside the chariot. But don't think of this chariot like in Ben-Hur, like he's racing down the road, right? So he may just been going at kind of a little more than a walking pace. And he's actually reading out loud. Here's a man with his Bible open, and he's reading the scripture. How many times, wouldn't you love to come across somebody like that who would say, Richard, what is, this, what is this man Peter talking about in this verse? Hey, you hear somebody reading out loud at a cafe, and you say, do you understand what you read? I don't, could you help me understand my Bible, what this is talking about? This is such a beautiful scene in so many ways. So he says, go over, join the chariot. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand? I love that because it's a big difference between reading the Bible and understanding the Bible, right? It reminds me of Matthew 9 when Jesus said to the Jews, it was pro probably almost insulting to the Jewish leader for him to say, go learn what this means. Now they knew what it said, but not what it meant. Go learn what this means. That requires interpretation. We have to interpret the Bible. I once heard one of our preachers say as he welcomed visitors at a worship assembly, we in the churches of Christ do not interpret the Bible. We just take it like it is. And uh, with no interpretation, and I thought, well, that, that's just not true. You, and that statement itself is not in the Bible. So he had to interpret things in the Bible to think to, that we should arrive at the position where we claim not to interpret the Bible. You know, it was just kind of a self-contradictory thing and didn't make any sense at all. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Now, that doesn't mean a person can't pick up his Bible today with the whole canon of scripture and sufficiently learn what God requires of him to do to be saved and to know to be saved. But in this context, at this moment, he can't know of whom Isaiah was speaking. So he's reading a course of messianic, Isaiah the messianic prophet, one of the great messianic prophecies of, 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 the, Bible, of the Hebrew Bible. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Wow, so this is a, this is a thrilling thing. And so what, is it, what does it say? Now the passage of Scripture that he was reading is this. And so now we have the citation of not the Hebrew, but the Greek translation of the, the Hebrew text, which is a little different. And it's modified a little bit, apparently, by Luke or uh, by the Spirit in the way, what we read here. So here's what the text said. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, 
Justice was denied him. Now remember, Luke is the gospel especially concerned with showing Jesus' death was unjust, that he was innocent, right? In Mark's gospel, the centurion says, behold, this, when Jesus dies on the cross, he says, behold, this was a son of God. In Luke's gospel, what does the soldier say? This was a righteous man. The, the robber on the cross who was crucified with Jesus says, this man did nothing amiss. Luke wants to emphasize, and he does over and over in Acts, he was the righteous one. He died an innocent man. He was unjustly crucified. That's something that's an emphasis in Luke, so you can see why he's bringing that out. Justice was denied him, so he was unjustly killed. Who can describe his generation, for his life was taken from the earth? And so the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I asked, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Was the prophet speaking of the servant here? Uh, and that's why this servant he has in mind, was, was it Isaiah? Was it someone else? And Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So remember this, the key starting point for understanding all of Scripture, Luke has shown this over and over. I brought it up again and again. Jesus is the, key, the interpretive key to all of the Bible. Everything in the Bible is about Jesus. And that's what Luke said at the end of Luke part 1, leading us in to this text, right? Whoops, I can't do that unless I move all this. For the love of mercy. All right, let's try, try that. Remember Luke 24? that Jesus on the road to Emmaus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he began to uh, interpret to them all in all the scriptures the things about himself. The whole Bible is about me, Jesus was saying. In verse 44, when he gave them the commission to go out into the world, he said everything written uh, about me in the law, both in the law of Moses, but also in, in the prophets and in the Psalms, they, they must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds. See, Christ is the key once you realize that Jesus is the interpretive key. It opens us to the proper understanding of, of the scriptures. He opened our minds to understand the scriptures and that it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise again. So that, that, let me put that point back in there. It's very important. Now as time runs out here then, as he teaches him, that citation is from Isaiah 53. But that context several times speaks of this servant of the Lord who Sometimes it refers to Israel, but sometimes this servant of the Lord is distinguished from Israel and someone who is suffering on behalf of Israel. And this context actually starts, I have 53 there, Isaiah 53, but this goes back to the end of chapter 52 about my servant. See the reference to my servant? So this is the part of Isaiah where it has the servant songs that, uh, where, which poetically talk about God using this servant and he shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. And then here are the parts of the Isaiah 53 then that are cited in the New Testament. Who has believed our message? What he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then down here in verses 5 and 6, Peter refers to his wounds. By his wounds we are uh, healed. All we like uh, sheep have gone astray. Peter alludes to that. Now here's the part cited in so in other words Luke is showing you part of surely he was reading and teaching him from this whole context not just that little snippet that Luke includes and that involved this text right here uh, how when he was afflicted he did not open his mouth and that how uh, he had done we, we have other references later again by Peter he had done no violence there was no guile in his mouth but despite the fact that he suffers this is the prophecy the reason Think of what you could teach this man about Jesus then from this text. That he would be high, even though he would suffer, and he would be unjustly killed. That God was going to raise him from the dead. That God was going to highly exalt him, as we saw at the end of chapter 52, and prolong his days, right? That in dying, he was actually bearing our iniquities. He was numbered with the transgressors, and yet he bore the sin of many. See, Jesus quotes that in Luke and says, what is uh, said in Scripture must be fulfilled concerning me. And then he quoted that from this text. He was numbered with the transgressor. So Jesus himself applied this text to him. That's the text he's reading from 
And it's interesting to see the parallel. The, the w way it reads here in Acts 8 is not exactly like the Greek translation, but it's very similar. And you see, whoops, uh, you see a difference with the, the Hebrew where it w reads differently. Is look at this statement. Look at the beginning, how they're similar. Like a sheep that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep before it shears is silent in the Hebrew. But then the next line over here on the left uh, after so he opens not his mouth, is in his humiliation. Justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? The, the Hebrew is by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And, and in his generation, who considered that he would die, that he would be cut off out of the land of the living? And so then what happens, of course, is he preached unto him Jesus, and when he as they go on their way, he sees water and he wants to be baptized. This is what I'll ask you next time. Notice right here, verse 36, verse 38. Where's verse 37? And I want to show you a lot of artwork from this episode because almost all of them, when the text says, we'll get to this, we'll start next time with this. The text says they both went down into the water, right? And he baptized them. But how do you almost always see in classical artwork, the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch is portrayed. <laughs> See, they both went down into the water, and he baptized them. Just to fill up that little shell. Yeah, why go down into the water if that's all you've got to do? All right. Well, they went down to the water, but they didn't go down into the water. And then he just poured. Uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful piece of art though. Heather, kill the lights as we close here. I just want everyone to enjoy that for a minute. Look at how, uh, it's a great work of art. Great art! Terrible theology! Right? So that's the problem. Here's another one. The pouring the water! Yeah, I'll show these quickly at the beginning of class. Here's, here's another one. And they're all very imaginative, I mean, in the way they try to portray the scene and his entourage and all of that. Can, could not one artist understand what Baptism was? Well, because in this area, ah, somebody got it right. There we go. Yes, that's what you have. And he went on his way rejoicing. Look how happy he is, too. I like that one. By the way, that. Was together with an entourage or was it just him alone? Uh, I, I find it unlikely he would have traveled without some kind of, like when we send the Secretary of State somewhere, he doesn't just show up. You know, and take an Uber from the airport, <laughs> right? He's got uh, his whole entourage. But that was, I think, an artwork from the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to use Jehovah's Witness artwork to get it right. Uh, so that's a shame. But thanks for your good attention. This is such a beautiful, beautiful story in the Bible. Plus, Barry, he wouldn't have been driving and reading at the same time. That would have been saying. Oh, driving the chariot, texting, reading while driving, texting while driving, distracted driving. You make a good point, Mike. He was. That would be violating the. If you read scripture while you're driving today, uh, that's a problem, I guess.